It is hard to imagine a movie car more synonymous with a film franchise than that of the 1981 DeLorean DMC-12 that many would argue was the real star of the 1985 sci-fi comedy blockbuster that was Back to the Future. Becoming a character in its own right, the time machine from the Back to the Future trilogy and subsequent spin-offs is one of the few props from a film that has become an almost holy grail among movie car enthusiasts. By no means a particularly special car in its own before its use in the film, the DeLorean and its story has now become legend within the movie industry and a staple for 80s nostalgia among fans. Celebrating the 35th anniversary of the original film's release, the Back to the Future time machine and its journey is now part of history itself. Going back to a time of innovation and a greater attempt at originality, the origins of the one and only car ever to be built by the DeLorean Motor Company has its roots based in the muscle car era of the 1960s and early 70s. Though already known within the motor vehicle community beforehand, it was the success of the 1964 Pontiac GTO that put John Zachary DeLorean on the motor industry map as he has been credited as the main contributor to that car's success and the birth of the muscle car era. It was this success that made DeLorean the golden boy of the car industry and his extravagant, almost celebrity-like style stand out among his motor vehicle executive counterparts. DeLorean would go on to have even more success in creating the Pontiac Firebird and would become the youngest president at General Motors before the age of 50. Leaving General Motors after being forced out in 1973, John DeLorean went on to start his own motor company and wanted to make an American two-seater sports car to rival the European style and market. Giving his new company his own name along with its first car, it was here that the DMC DeLorean's birth and ultimate demise would begin. Starting off with wanting to capitalize a whole new design and approach, Italian designer Giorgetto Giugiaro, who had been known for designing cars for such companies as Aston Martin, Alfa Romeo, Maserati along with Ferrari and Lotus, was brought in by DeLorean to design his new one-of-a-kind car along with Colin Chapman of Lotus fame brought in to design the chassis. In order to get his dream off the ground, DeLorean needed financial backing and got it through his many years of connections and was able to secure millions of dollars to put his plan in motion along with obtaining a large investment from the British government to have the factory to build his car brought to the UK to help secure work for the then struggling island. It was in 1976 that his prototype was finally on display and was a close representation to the final product that was to be, yet had different styling choices more reflective of the time, most notably in its brown European style trim interior. Its famous gullwing doors were present along with its stainless steel over fiberglass panels. When production went underway in its factory in Northern Ireland, an engine was commissioned and built in France that was to be the Peugeot Renault Volvo 2.85 litre SOHC V6 that only had an output of 130 horsepower and 153 pound-feet of torque. Being rushed into production and release, the DMC-12 was plagued with a number of mechanical and technical issues upon its release. In order to make the improvements required, DeLorean needed more financial support as he was already over the originally expected budget and manufacturing costs. It was in late 1982 that John DeLorean would land himself in hot water when a $6.5 million cocaine FBI bus was put underway after an acquaintance of John's who knew of his financial difficulties and in order to save himself after being charged for other criminal activities, offered to give up an unaware DeLorean to the feds. This led to a film drug bust in a Los Angeles hotel room that would later be leaked to the press and subsequently affect the outcome of DeLorean's conviction. It was as a direct result of this stage bust that the DMC factory would be shut down in the UK and it finally led to the ultimate downfall of DeLorean's then struggling motor company as all financial support had ceased along with production. Beautifully crafted for long life, the DeLorean is one of the most awaited automobiles in automotive history. Drive the DeLorean. Live the dream today.
With a reported top speed of only 109 miles per hour, the early release of the DMC DeLorean was lacking in speeds that would impress at the time in the automotive market, yet was not as slow as people would assume for the early 80s, given the then still emission restrictions imposed on car manufacturers. This, and several other issues on the car however, was part of the reason a revision of the vehicle was in the works, and was part of the reason a scramble for funds were needed which helped lead to the contribution of the train wreck that was just around the corner waiting to happen. With his legal problems doing their part to bring down his company, the mediocre performance and the other issues of the DMC-12 itself brought forth an underwhelming reception upon the car's release. The DeLorean was not the new step into the future of automotive engineering John DeLorean was hoping for. Even one of the company's financial backers, talk show legend Johnny Carson, had famously been found after receiving his brand new off-the-boat DMC-12 trapped inside after electrical failure caused the doors to not open and the car to switch off. And since the windows were no bigger than a mailbox, it had showed its failing of being trapped inside of the machine with no real exit. Improvements were eventually made to correct most flaws, but the damage had already been done and the DMC-12 had lost a lot of buyer interest, not least due to its then price tag of $25,000 US in 1981, which was around $70,000 in today's money. The DeLorean had vanished just as quickly as it had arrived. It was not the original success story that John DeLorean had hoped for after 1984 he was acquitted of his charges due to the case being seen as an entrapment by the US government. It was a bittersweet ending however, when the current company he had hoped would put his brand name on the auto industry map, closed its doors, and the DMC-12 was thought to forever fade into obscurity and be seen as a failed experiment in automotive history. It was around at this time, two Hollywood filmmakers were trying to get the project of their own off the ground. Written by Bob's Galen Zemeckis, a treatment of a story of a teenager and his adventures through time where he would meet his parents in the past was circulating around Hollywood with little to no interest from producers. No one wants to see a movie about a teenager making out with his mother, an executive had said at Disney after the script had been presented and passed. It was not until the script was picked up by Universal Pictures and Steven Spielberg's company Amblin, the later of which was always a supporter of the project, would the production of Back to the Future get underway. Originally written as a refrigerator to be towed around on the back of a pickup truck, the film's time travelling device was later rewritten to be a car instead in order to be self-mobile and partially due to the fear of children locking themselves inside their home appliance. In a radical turn, the writer and director opted for the DMC DeLorean as their car of choice after seeing the DeLorean case unfold on nationwide television and thought it would be a crazy idea if they chose the DMC instead due to its now notorious infamy. Not least, the Goldwing Doors also contributed to the decision as it gave the car an almost alien appearance that would play well into the time traveling stories set in the 1950s. Approached by the Ford Motor Company with an offer of $75,000 in financial support for the film to brandish their product in the form of a third generation Mustang, writer Bob Gale would famously go on to say, Doc Brown doesn't drive a f***ing Mustang. <laughs> this was a decision that would give the DMC-12 a new lease on life and forever immortalize it with the 80s after the writers stuck with their original choice. Gale and Zemeckis brought in cartoonist and film designer Ron Cobb, who they had met while he was working with John Milius on Conan the Barbarian, and would ask him to come up with a number of concepts for the appearance of the time machine, after the original designer Andrew Probert's designs fell just short of what the filmmakers were looking for, as it was considered too sleek in appearance. Within two weeks after bringing him in, Ron Cobb designed a time machine that looked as though it would have been made in a garage as per request, and gave it a type of logic and a sense of how it would function, much to the delight of the producers and writers, and the designs would then be once more finalized by Probert. Once the sketches and final approval had been made, the production team obtained three DeLoreans for the first film, five in total for the whole franchise during the production run. One would be a complete hero car used for exterior, the other for interior, and the third was chopped into different sections to be used on stage for different process shots. The A Hero car, with VIN number 5261, being an October 81 built DeLorean that was originally shipped to be sold at Hidden Hills, California, would eventually be purchased for production and used as the main car featured throughout the film. Under the supervision of production designer Larry Paul, the task to bring the time machine to life was left in the hands of art department liaison Michael Fink, though due to other work obligations would bring in and insist on construction coordinator Michael Chaffe to take over as the special effects supervisor Kevin Pike. Chaffe had gained attention for his work on the TV series Automan and its modified 1974 Lamborghini Countach and for his uncredited work on Kit in the Knight Rider TV series. With no specific idea of parts that would be used to construct the time machine, the production team gathered an array of different bits and pieces that could be found to try and match the original designs given to them. This meant some parts would be found and used from old aircraft and obtained from junk stores, even to the point of adding wooden components to match the design Rob Cobb had drawn and would be painted to look metallic. 
We've started with a DeLorean. Basically, it's been three DeLoreans. And we've added all sorts of aircraft parts that we've dug up from different bins and surplus electronic houses around the city. All this work is to provide a very interesting vehicle for the characters in the movie to go back and forth in time. Because the speedometer of the DeLorean only read up to 85 miles per hour, and the script called for the car to time travel at 88, a special speedometer sticker was made and inserted in one of the cars used for the interior shots that read 95 miles per hour. One thing that had not been fully determined in the designs was the now infamous flux capacitor in terms of its location and presentation as it was originally thought of in the early designs to appear differently and at a different location on the time machine than it would later appear on. It would be Michael Fink who had worked with Paul on Blade Runner and later on Tim Burton's Batman Returns who would go on to solve this problem and would design and build the flux capacitor as we know it today. With the DeLorean time machine now completed, it was up to the cast and crew to do the rest and bring back to the future to fruition. How far are you going? About 30 years. Released on July 3rd, 1985, Back to the Future was a box office juggernaut bringing in close to $400 million worldwide on a $19 million budget. The film went on to win a number of awards and was nominated for several Academy Awards, but only winning an Oscar for Best Effects Sound Effects Editing. The film would cement the career of its lead Michael J. Fox into international stardom and further the career of Zemeckis, who went on to direct hit after hit following this success. It would come as no surprise that a further two films would be commissioned by Universal to be made off the huge hit of the original film, which ended with the audience seeing the DeLorean fly away almost off the screen, leaving high expectations behind. In order to complete the follow-up films, three to four more time machines would be needed for the filming of the sequels in the soon-to-be-completed trilogy. Due to the next film to start off in the future year that was 2015, one of the DeLoreans was made out of fiberglass for the flying scenes when the car was needed to be seen landing and taking off as it was attached to a crane to move it about while smaller models were created for the effects of seeing the car flown in the wider shots. To work around the story issues of the plutonium that was needed to power the time machine originally, the idea was made to have the futuristic inclusion of a garbage powered extension added to the exterior components. The inclusion of a device called Mr. Fusion for the DeLorean seen at the end of the first film was handed by Michael Shafate and the prop was taken from a Krupp's coffee grinder and despite seeing this component and the ability to fly come the end of the first film, this would differentiate the DeLorean come the second film as it would be more affiliated with the later installment. Though minor modifications were required for the overall appearance of the DeLorean in Back to the Future Part 2, save for the changes needed for the wheels to fold to add the aesthetic of the car when it flew, it was Part 3 when the time machine would have more radical changes added to it. The DeLorean would have its suspension lifted for the desert driving scenes, along with the inclusion of 1950s white wall tires and later replaced with makeshift wheels for train track usage. In addition, extra electrical components reflective of 1950s sci-fi style parts needed and used to repair the then refurbished DeLorean were also included into the car's overall appearance. A Pepsi bottle transfer tray was mounted along with said components onto the front of the time machine, which further added to the scramble parts look to get the DeLorean operating once again. Being filmed back to back and released six months apart, Back to the Future 2 and 3 were once more box office hits and finished off the live action films on a high note. With the DeLoreans no longer needed, and with one part three DeLorean completely demolished, it is said that only three complete vehicles survived the production of the films. Back to the Future enthusiasts Bill and Patrick Shea obtained the other remaining part three time machine as it is now part of their own private collection along with several other vehicles and props from the trilogy which they now offer for special events and occasions while another surviving DeLorean is said to still be on display at Universal Studios in Florida. The third and main original film used hero car that survived was put on display at the Hollywood Universal Studios lot where it resided for many years as an almost forgotten attraction by the studio owners as it was left outdoors and unprotected with a number of parts being stolen or destroyed over time by visiting fans who would often take home a souvenir. It was at the insistence of Bob Gale after seeing the condition of the car that he requested to Universal Studios that the car be fully restored and properly preserved. After seeing the detailed work on creating a replica for themselves, Bob Gale suggested the folks at OutofTimeMovie.com, Terry Metalis and Joe Walzer, who after being commissioned with the task, spent over a year to rebuild the vehicle to match its original iconic film appearance. Once this was achieved, 
The DeLorean would end up being given to the Peterson Automotive Museum, where it was put on display on April 22, 2016, and is currently located there, while other replicas created by Terry and Joe would go on to be used for promotional tours, and one would make its way to the Academy Awards and feature on Jay Leno's Garage. Thirty years have passed since the last live-action installment into the Back to the Future franchise. With no intention or interest from the writer and director to create any future follow-ups, the Time Machine DeLorean regularly pops up within media more so than ever before in recent years, perhaps due to this lack of cinematic availability. Beating commercials, video games, cartoons, along with making cameo appearances in other movies and on TV and at conventions, and is still a popular choice among car collectors, who have replicated the Time Machine perhaps more than any other film car known. Even away from its connection to the film, the DeLorean DMC-12 on its own is a desired collectible and the center point of a number of car clubs across the globe that have created an almost cult following of this one-of-a-kind car. Original new parts are still available, along with the ability to obtain a complete brand new DeLorean itself, as the thousands of replacement components that were never sold along with unused chassis still exist and had been obtained by a company who now hold the rights to the DMC name and have plans to once again produce the DMC-12 for the automotive market. Marred with its own checkered history due to its production failures, the DeLorean DMC-12 and its creator, along with the film that cemented its place within pop culture, have gone on to not just be a blip in the motor vehicle and movie industry, but a permanent part of nostalgia and people's childhoods from the 80s. Though few movie cars have gone on to be as fondly cherished as the DeLorean Back to the Future time machine, which now rests in a museum for the world to see in its preserved state, one thing is certain, its affiliation with the 1980s, both in its good and some of its bad moments, are forever connected in that one image of a car that once it reached 88 miles per hour changed movies and pop culture forever. <laughs>